Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jeffrey Goldberg, Editor-in-Chief of The Atlantic. You don't have to clap, it's fine, it's fine. Thanks, um, good morning. Um, thank you all for being here. I would just wanna um, uh, welcome you all again on behalf of The Atlantic and behalf of the IOP at the University of Chicago. Um, a special thank you to uh, my partner in this, David Axelrod. Um, uh, really um, a, a fruitful and smooth partnership here. Uh, uh, let me just also very quickly thank um, some of our, some of the sponsors, the Bentivoglio Family Fund, the Joyce Foundation, and the Crankshaft Foundation, making this all possible. Um, very, very glad to see all of you. It's a little bit more of a relaxed day without the Secret Service. Um, uh, and um, this is the day when we sort of bear down, I think, on some of the um, some of the issues that were raised in the rather intense sprint um, yesterday afternoon. Um, it was a it was a great session. Maria Ressa uh, is extraordinary, and Ann Applebaum and and David Adrian LaFrance, um, my colleague and friend, um, really sharpened some of the questions. And I think we had the pretty rare opportunity of seeing um, an ex-president work through some of these issues live in front of us. Uh, I think he's in the beginning uh, of um, a process of figuring out where he stands on these questions. And um, obviously the where he lands will have great deal of impact on how, among other things, uh, we approach the issue of social media companies and their responsibility and obviously Something that was moving to me um, was his very, very forthright uh, understanding of the role of, um, uh, and I'm not using this term in a, in a judgmental way, of uh, vulture capitalists um, and their um, willingness to destroy American journalism. But again, no judgment. Just, <laughs> just, just stating it, you know, objectively. That's a, an objective truth. Um, and 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 that's that's extraordinarily important. Um, I'm going to turn it over to to, to David um, right now. Uh, but uh, I, I want to introduce this this session. Actually, this first session. And by the way, the whole day is um, really fascinating. And I hope you you stick around. Um, the um, session at 11 on 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 understanding the power of algorithms. I think is going to be uh, a great follow up to some of the issues that Maria raised yesterday and, and obviously um, a discussion on conspiracy theories and their salience is extraordinarily important. Um, this session this uh, morning, Politics as Usual or an Insidious Attack on Our Democracy, this actually came out of a conversation um, that uh, I had with David early, early in the planning process. Um, it, followed a, um, it followed a column uh, by Ben Smith um, who is on the panel this morning, where he was raising questions, uh, questions that we, we, we talked about in various forms yesterday, questions about um, when is it actually disinformation, is disinformation as, as, as an big an existential challenge as some of us think it is? Uh, and so David and I were talking and said we should do a kind of a level setting conversation um, just to understand, uh, understand the level of existential threat and whether we're overplaying it. And I think this is a good conversation to have. Um, uh, and then following that conversation, um, you have um, Joan Donovan and, and Meg Kelly talking about um, uh, reality. That's gonna be a good one. Um, but this first session, in addition to Ben, who uh, as you know until recently, um, uh, was the media columnist for the New York Times, former editor of BuzzFeed, um, a friend of a lot of us in, in the room, and the editor of Semaphore, his new media project, which maybe if we're lucky, he'll actually tell us what it is today. Um, um, we have um, Adrian LaFrance, my colleague, who you saw yesterday uh, talking on this subject, and Jonah Goldberg, uh, the editor-in-chief of The Dispatch. Um, this is one, of, a, a couple of years ago, as a goof, Jonah and I 
created a panel which included Michelle Goldberg. It was like the three tenors of Goldbergs. Um, and it was fun because people always blame me for things that he writes. Um, so now that we're both in the same room, you'll see that we are actually different people. Um, very excited about that. So let me, um, let me just turn it over to uh, David and his all-star panel. Thanks very much for coming and we'll see you throughout the day. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. David. Okay, good. Um, so, Ben Smith, you've been outed as the provocateur behind this panel. Uh -uh. So I want to start with you. you. You wrote, I mean, a very thoughtful, I thought, nuanced uh, column, and, but the premise was, or at least the question you were raising is, are we overdoing? Uh, on disinformation? Uh, are we including too many things in that category? Are we ascribing to disinformation things that were not actually uh, a function of disinformation or a product of disinformation? So since we've got all these people here and all these experts coming, we rented this nice room, we've got this <laughs> backdrop, are we wasting our time? Um, well, I think we, well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's good to be an honorary Goldberg, and I'm amazed <laughs> how many of you showed up at this hour, um, which su suggests there is some interest in the topic. Um, you know, I guess I think that there are people, no, I think obviously there is, you know, you can define the word how you want it, which people do not spend a lot of time doing, and then there are a lot of academics like Joan and, and other, many other folks who are trying in a disciplined way to figure out what is this phenomenon, that said, we also love to tell ourselves stories. Part of the, and, and I think you know, I was the media columnist for the Times, and I think journalists in particular love to seize on a framework and just like see everything through that lens. And I think there's, you know, there's, there, there are things that wind up getting labeled misinformation because you don't like who's saying them, basically. Like these liars are saying, are talking about this Hunter Biden laptop, so like thus it is misinformation, which, you know, it had all the formal characteristics of misinformation. It had the kind of inconvenient fact that it was true. And you had people almost arguing that, well, it can be misinformation and true, which is pretty troubling. Um, and I think more broadly, there's a tendency in institutions like this one, and I'm curious what you think of this, to sort of reduce politics to information, like that the, the, the people's politics are like basically motivated by a set of kind of factual statements about the world that you can poll, and that when somebody calls you and says, do you think Obama was born in Kenya, that the response that someone is giving is basically, well, I've done the research and I've thought about the birth certificates as opposed to, I hate that guy, screw him. And I do think that there's a sort of framework that you find more broadly, particularly like at universities full of people who care a lot about information that, that project this idea onto other people, that politics is mostly motivated by like a set of factual beliefs about factual statements rather than by tribalism and emotion and identity, which well, have less to do with information. Uh, Adrian, you've, you, you're steeped in all of this. Um, isn't the whole, uh, isn't the thing that makes disinformation uh, so powerful uh, the very thing that Ben's talking about, which is tribalism and emotion and so on? Isn't it sort of designed to, uh, to capitalize on those things and exacerbate those things and widen chasms? Absolutely. I mean, I think when, when information is weaponized in whatever way, whether it's disinformation or to, you know, manipulate or through political ads or whatever it may be, it's, and this came up yesterday as well, it's, it's trying to get an emotional reaction out of people and assuming that you know what sort of buttons you can press. And we see that all the time. To Ben's point, though. That's just politics, right? I mean, that's. Right. Well, and yeah. And also, what is the, well, politics is that. Let me just, now I'm in a position to defend politics. <laughs> <laughs> Awkward. Um, th but uh, there's a difference between, um, between pushing buttons by raising issues, even raising issues in ways that, you, uh, you know, that some might think is misleading. We, you know, President Obama had this discussion with Jeff yesterday. There's a difference between that and just making stuff up that is wholly untrue uh, for the purposes of inflaming. I mean, I think that is the, 
nuance, Jonah. Yeah, so, uh, and maybe I just misheard Ben, uh, but he kept using Generally the word. when people say, maybe I just misheard Ben, they're not gonna yeah. say something uh -uh. good. Um, <laughs> uh, I think it was just a malapropism, you know, uh -huh. and, and that happens to everybody, including the President of the United States. Like three minutes into the <laughs> But you said, no, but you, you kept using the word misinformation instead of disinformation, and the, definition, the, the definitional difference between the two is misinformation is information that is false, but the person spreading it or divulging it doesn't necessarily know that, right? And disinformation is lying, is saying things that you know not to be true. So misinformation can be a callous disregard for whether or not the stuff is true, but you don't actually know you're lying, while disinformation is the actual art of deception. And I think one, that's a very useful heuristic when we're talking about how to distinguish the hurly-burly of politics from more nefarious things. Do you have good reason to believe that the person telling you something that benefits, their, benefits them politically or otherwise is just simply lying versus rather just acting on confirmation bias or telling you something that they think is, to be, is true or they're cutting a political ad that is misleading but they can defend it on truth grounds versus just straight up lying? And I think, you know, so for intelligence and national security purposes, dis the conversations we were hearing yesterday about Russia, um, what Russia does is disinformation. It's flat out, right? And, and I think one of the problems we have today is we think it started with like the social media age, when in fact Vladimir Putin comes from a tradition in the KGB of doing this for a very long time. So he has new, new he tools. He has new tools. I'm not sure these tools are I think these, these tools are more effective in some ways and less effective in other ways, but the KGB was behind efforts to sow racial discord in the United States in the 1960s and 1970s. They tried to smear Martin Luther King in all sorts of ways. Uh, they wanted him to be replaced by Stokely Carmichael. They tried to foment race war in the United States. This is an old playbook going far back that they used tactics like planting stories and third world newspapers so they would then migrate to useful idiots in the West who would then reprint it as if it was fact. And that's disinformation, that's nefarious. I think the problem that we have today, and we can talk about it more, is that we essentially, because of social media, live in the age of the intellectual wet market, right? The real wet markets are these things where animals are kept in cages too close together and they become vectors for pathogens that pass from one animal to another, then to humans and all that. Um, we live in an intellectual wet market where the space between bullshit and reality has been so compressed and there are so many incentive structures and permission structures to take lies and act on them as if they are truth and then to believe them that it becomes just this very difficult to disentangle ball of, of dysfunction. And Adrian, just to take it back to the technology because I, I think Jonah may be downplaying the turbocharging element of, of social media. You wrote a a piece which you sh <laughs> shared with me uh, uh, a couple of years ago called The Doomsday Machine, which recalls the atomic explosion that Maria set off here yesterday. <laughs> Twice. Um, <coughs> what, I mean, how do you react to what Jonah said? I, I think what he said, I agree with what he said, and I think, it, it, to your point about the social web, I think there is this great flattening that the internet has, has you know, imposed on all of information and all of our experiences with information. And, um, and listening to you, I'm also thinking about the sort of spectrum, right? So it's not just that like this thing is false, this thing is true. This thing is merely misleading. This thing is an outright lie. Like there's this, like, this, tr this spectrum and everyone now participates in it. So while one politician may put out a, a campaign ad that's merely misleading but defensible on truth grounds, as you put it, although like to me, like is that truly defensible? I'm not so sure. Um, then you may have an entire group of people who are then out there, you know, in effect helping that politician because they can get the message that like, oh, this is part of my tribe, this is part of the ide ideology that I'm here to defend, and I'll now go out and use various social platforms to uh, advance this political cause in ways that don't adhere to any sort of ethics or standards or truth, and it becomes this, you know, giant ball of dysfunction. And so I think that, it, it, you know, it, we, again, we talked about this a bit yesterday, but the democratization of publishing through the internet should have been and is in many ways a great and, and miraculous thing and at the same time enables this, you know, just anyone can say anything and it can go completely viral and spread at scale in a way that we've never experienced before in human history. 
So Ben, when we were waiting on the uh, side here, he was holding on to his uh, overcoat, uh, and like I, I accused him. I accused him of uh, of uh, planning to leave in the middle of this panel if it, <laughs> if he became too much the object of everyone's uh, skepticism. But so in the uh, you know at the risk of you bolting, yeah. I, I just want to pursue one thing with you, which is you said when people get called by a pollster, I'm not sure that pollsters actually called and said, do you think President Obama was born in Kenya? Maybe, they, maybe some pollsters did. But do you think that this was just a, so could you say anything about Obama uh, and people would, some 30 or 30% 30 would say, that's true, Obama uh, is a mass murderer, Obama is this or that, and because they disliked them, they would, or was that the product of a, of a campaign? I mean, I guess I think the answer in a lot of these cases is some of both, right? Like when Trump is out there ranting about Obama and insulting him, I don't think people are sweating the details. It's a partisan, tribal kind of signal. Um, and I think maybe that's in a way the broader point I was just trying to make is just that like there's this whole fabric of stuff happening on our culture and television is a big part of it. The internet is a tool on which a lot of this stuff is spread, but I do think it's, I think pulling the sort of, infor trying to pull the informational part out of it, you know, is, is, is both, I think, kind of limiting and a little out of date. Like, I do think, like, I think if you looked at Maria's charts yesterday of, of the kind of way in which in 2016, like, specific, like, these botnets were being set up by the, by government, by essentially government actors, I actually think the landscape in social media has changed quite a lot. And in a lot of these authoritarian countries, they're not setting up botnets anymore. They are shutting down the internet. And the only way you can get anything resembling reality in Russia is to use all the tools that we are condemning here, is to make your own show on YouTube, to find some path through Telegram into the, to, to. So it's, you know, it's like, these are these tools that are incredibly effective for waging war on the establishment, which here have done enormous damage to all the norms and values and stru structures that, you know, that we probably largely wish they had not done. But they're kind of neutral tools. And in Russia right now, they're being used. But I isn't, guess, so. isn't part of the, part of what we're engaging in here, Russia's not a democracy. Correct. We're talking about democracies here and the impact on democracies, which are open, more open societies, where in fact, uh, government does not control uh, content in the way that they're controlled in autocracies. But it does allow those who want to undermine democracy uh, to use those tools to sow chasms. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Adrian, you're, you're, um, uh, you're, uh, you're very agreeable with your panel mates this morning, but I mean, <laughs> is it, is that, that's, it seems to me that, be, I'm trying to justify why we're here. <laughs> I need a little help. I'll try. Okay. But why, um, doesn't in an open society, uh, isn't there a great invitation for malign actors, both domestic and 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 uh, and uh, you know global? Uh, doesn't it, isn't it an invitation for them to? Absolutely, I and mean, this is why it's so complicated. Unfortunately, See, I, I told you, Ben. I do agree with Ben. Is the problem in that, like, I mean, Telegram is a good example, right? Like, Telegram was used to help the people who yes. planned January 6th carry out that attack. And also, it's what Ukrainians are using to have the, you know, facilitate their resistance. And so it, I, I d definitely disagree that these tools are neutral. I don't think any technology is truly neutral. I mean, so, well, maybe that's overstating it. I'd have to think through that some more. But I don't think that you can say the social web is at all neutral, in part because of how the companies are incentivized. And, so, and especially when you look at the big American platforms, you know, and it's, th they're not here, they use lots of like euphemisms about community and giving people voices, but that's not actually at their core what they're, they exist to do. And so when you look at how they're designed, it is for their own profit. And uh, like, that's what a business is, it's understandable. Yes, exactly. And yet it is completely at odds with sort of what they're saying that they can do for democracy because in fact they are undermining it actively. And isn't that sort of the point of our discussions here, which is that, uh, like I, I mean, I think I said this yesterday when I was talking to Anne, I don't expect these platforms to govern themselves uh, in the way that we, they, they are not a public trust. They are businesses. 
Uh, and so they, they impact on the public, but, they, but their goal is to make profit. And when, when you have situations like that, it seems to me there, are, there is a responsibility for policymakers to impose some regulations, some rules of the road, some guardrails. Jonah, you're, a, uh, so, I mean, you're not a big government guy. What do you think? Um, well, get to that one second. I, I, when you say you're trying to justify why we're up here, one way to do it is to flip the title of this panel or this event and say, the erosion of democracy, colon, and disinformation, right? Because the real problem, I think, is on the problems with democracy side and not the disinformation side. The problems with the democracy side are structural, they're endemic, um, and they're very real. And I think the place where this, the, the social web or social media, whatever we're supposed to call it these days, comes in is that there's a lot of talk, I do a lot of it, about the erosion of institutions in our society you know, and and all that, but one of the reasons why we have the erosion of institutions is technology now allows communicators, to use a neutral term, to go around institutions in ways that never before. Um, you know, the, the role, the edit function of editors, historically, is to be this sort of circuit breaker on bad ideas. Um, to say, go, you know, you, you haven't proven this to their writer, say, um, come back to me when you've, you know, you toned this thing down um, to, uh, you know, basically be um, not just a gatekeeper in terms of validating certain ideas, but a gatekeeper for actual communicators to say, you cannot, this is where we are the toll takers and we're going to stop you from carrying this BS any further. And now you have a whole class of social media influencers and other jackwads um, who, have no editors. If you're one of those, raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and you know, the whole, you know, the, the point of editing is to filter. And we're living increasingly in a filterless society. And so my argument about a lot of things, um, including the dysfunctions of our democracy more generally, is that the existing institutions need to be stronger, not weaker. We've democratized too much. Democracy historically, you know, as E. E. Schatzneider and other political scientists would say, is the space between the political parties, right? It's not something that defines the internal nature of the political parties. But we have basically democratized the political parties to a point where they can't be gatekeepers. They have no edit function on the craziness. Um, so much of the Democratic Party is beholden to what AOC says on Twitter or what Donald Trump used to say on Twitter. Um, it's a lot of, uh, you know, tail chasing. Um, and what this is, if we're going to improve democracy, one of the ways we do that is by strengthening the institutions that have the edit function on social passion. I'm not a big Marshall McLuhan guy, or at least I wasn't before, but I now think he was basically right. The medium is the message, and social media encourages mobocracy. It encourages the rule of mob politics in all sorts of serious ways, what the Greeks called aquacracy. And you know when when uh, what's his name uh, when Mark Antony swung sw swung the bloody toga, he could only do it in front of the mob that was in front of him, and now you can swing a bloody toga figuratively in front of a billion people almost instantaneously, and it shouldn't shock us that it infects our politics and makes us very vulnerable to the kind of people who are willingly, are willing and eager to inject lies into our politics. Do you think Mark Ant Antony would regret being born too early? <laughs> um, he really liked killing people, so at least according to the HBO series, so I'm not sure. Uh, but let, let, Can I just yeah, go ahead, Adrian. I think the, the too much democracy thing, though, I don't think is precise enough. I think it's actually because, like, the the ability for any individual to exercise their right to free press by publishing something on the internet is objectively great. Like, that's a good thing. I think. I think the problem is not so much democracy. I think it's that it's in the hands of these tech platforms, these very few. Whereas, like. You know, 20 plus years ago, to publish whatever you want on the internet, you had to put some degree of thought into like, learn how to make a website and like, try to get people to come to your website. And so again, those were like, either speed bumps or filters, whatever you want to call it. Now, because the, the power is in the hands of these very few tech platforms, it's it's not actually democratic in the same way. I, I take your point, Jonah, that um, uh, democracy has brought up deeper issues <coughs> than than. Uh, simply disinformation, but Ben, 
disinformation also is a tool to help unravel democracy for those who want to, is it not? It, those fissures that uh, Jonah's talking about uh, make democracies vulnerable uh, and uh, social media and all the tools that are available now with big data, with micro-targeting, and with the profit incentive uh, of the tech platforms, um, it, it, is a, uh, it is a weapon, and, uh, it's, and it's being used. Oh, for sure, and I feel like I'm, I'm, I can't, I'm not gonna like get into, backed into sort of being a spokesman for Facebook here. <laughs> I mean, obviously they, you know, the, the stuff that Adrian's talking about around the kind of their particularly, you know, in that kind of 2017, 18 period where they made some changes that made, like, made, that sort of ensured that the way to go viral was to make as many people as angry as possible, as fast as possible. I mean, I think they kind of technically enabled this kind of system that really favored the absolute worst in politics. Um, and maybe I'm just saying the obvious here, which is that there's a lot of other things happening. There is this global wave of populism that isn't entirely synonymous with social media. Mm -hmm. Some of it's driven by truth, some of it's driven by lies. It's, you know, and, and it's well. a complicated infrastructure, but I do think, you know, there's a line that Julia Yaffe had about, because I think also there w is this sort of intellectual moment in America post-2016 where a lot of liberals were just like, how did Donald Trump get elected? It must have been a trick. It must have been something wrong. Like maybe the Russia, it was the Russians. Maybe it was like Cambridge Analytica on Facebook. No one can ever quite explain to you what happened there, but it was magic and very powerful. But Julia Yaffe has this line that I always kind of loved, which was that like, you know, the Russians through Facebook, through WikiLeaks, were just kind of like throwing spaghetti at the wall of American democracy. What they did not know was that like the, the wall was falling apart, that, you know, the sauce got into these worn away bits of mortar and the whole thing fell down. But it's not, and, and you can give them, you know, and which doesn't, which is to say that these social media campaigns, disinformation, can have a lot of power and impact, but well, especially on, on, a very, on, a very weakened, on a very weakened system. Yeah, but we're talking about marginal races here where small impacts can have, yeah. can, where, can tip the scale. Right, where there are, right, where in any contest there are 50 or 60 really important things that happen. Well, and like a weapon doesn't have to be sophisticated to be dangerous also. Yeah. Yeah, so l let me ask you guys, because you, you raised, well, well, let me get into it this way. Um, one of the other impetuses for this panel was uh, a, a member of our advisory board, prominent conservative member of, of the IOP advisory board, who said, be careful, because disinformation uh, is, the word lands very differently with conservatives. It's a little, it's it's a little triggering. Yes, I mean, we, Part, the irony is disinformation widens polarization, but, and disinformation is also, the word itself is subject to polarization. So people hear that word and they say, well, that's just, uh, well, you know, jo Jonah, let me start with you, but I want to hear from all of you on this. Um, just uh, it briefly, just tell me uh, how conservatives process that word. Uh, well, it depends on the conservative, obviously, but sure, there's, there's a bunch of terms that um, that when uh, I'll just speak in broad generalizations, that when liberals or the mainstream media, you know, or it, to the extent that's not redundant, um, you get themselves all worked up about certain terms or certain concepts. Uh, there's a certain amount of appropriation, and then sort of Alinsky-eyed spinning of the uh, you know, redefining of the terms. One of the great examples of this was fake news. People forget in 2016, fake news actually referred to grifters in like Montenegro with server farms making up algorithm tricking nonsense stories. And then, and that was part of this liberal attempt to explain how Trump won and tie it to Facebook. And then Trump turned it and he flipped expropriated it. the term. He expropriated the term and said it actually defines the Washington Post, mm -hmm. right? Or any news that is inconvenient to Donald Trump. And so, incidentally, just on that point, he did an inter he had an interesting exchange with Leslie Stahl after he became after he was elected and before he took office, and he was and she asked him why are you always dumping on the media. And he said, because I don't want people to believe you when you say bad things about me. Yeah. And that's sort of, I think Putin would say the same thing. Yeah, he has yeah. a gift for saying the quiet part out loud on yes. all sorts of things, right? And, um, but I think that the, the, there is this sense, and, and it becomes more intense the further you move into the paranoid parts of the right, and the paranoid parts of the right are large, and they're influential, and they're growing, much to my dismay. I mean, uh, 
by five o'clock today, most of us will be pedophiles, according to some people on the right, right? And um, uh, just by sitting here with us, just by sitting, yep, just by not want, not wanting Donald Trump reinstated, as he told the Washington Post this morning. And um, so I think that there's there's the word disinformation feeds into this idea that it is the establishment or the powers that be or the deep state or the corrupt corporate media, whatever, that they are saying, you're not allowed to look at this information. This information is uh, illegitimate. And I got to tell you, the Hunter Biden laptop story did enormous yeah, well, let's, damage let's, on this let's, point. let's talk about that. Ben, you led your column with this. You mentioned it before. Um, and a young man raised it here yesterday. Uh, what about the Hunter Biden story? Because you were at a, con you, or, or at least you were aware of a conference at Harvard on this, uh, at which that the the way media handled that story was offered as a, 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 a an example of how to um, mitigate the impacts of uh, of manipulation, media manipulation. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about that and what you think about it now as this story has evolved and at least some elements of the, of the, uh, of the story have, pro have proven out apparently. Yeah, and I think I want to be careful about it because I think it's easy to say, like it's easy to talk as though things are symmetrical when they aren't. And, and the, the Hunter Biden laptop, you know, there, there is, um, you know, among, we, like we are all also susceptible to the kind of power of these narratives and affirmation and journalists in particular. Uh, coming from social media, that all your followers telling you this is misinformation, this is misinformation, like can be its own kind of narrative that you can fall for if you're not careful. And and everybody, and I think journalists were very kind of rightly keyed up for like, okay, like we really fucked up WikiLeaks. Sorry, we really Wiki, no, we, the WikiLeaks story. There's nobody and, listening. And we <laughs> and we need to be kind of ready to not fall for kind of a hack and dump operation. And. Not crazily, some people thought that the emergence of this laptop in the totally strangest way, pushed by some of the least reliable people, could be that. Um, and there was this whole sort of infrastructure in place, like we got it, we're gonna like do what we didn't do in WikiLeaks, we're gonna block it from the internet, we're gonna refuse to talk about it. And it, and those instincts and that narrative kicked in without people really trying to examine Including the story. by the social media platforms. Yeah, most disturbingly actually by the social media platforms. Like individual news outlets can be right, can be wrong, it's sort of less important. Um, Right, when in fact it was a real laptop. What it revealed was something that had been widely reported, although people weren't that interested in it because it wasn't the most important story in the world, which was that one of President Biden's sons was trading really egregiously on his name, but nobody had been able to tie it to anything, Any Biden, anything Joe Biden did. had done. And in fact, part of the reason this story got so garbled was Trump's people came into journalists at a thousand miles an hour saying, we have it, the smoking gun, that shows that Joe Biden is corrupt. And it didn't quite show that, but it had a bunch of other stuff. But isn't that in a way, yes, Which, uh, I mean, I, I agree yeah. with everything you said, but isn't that a w in a way, and I, I'll actually but, go down the row here, isn't that in a way how disinformation works? It's like we've got this much, we've got this, we've got A and we've got C. Like I used to have, yeah. I, I work, when I was a reporter and doing investigative reporting, my editors would say, you got A and you've got C, but you don't have B. Yeah, and you can't just And we're not going to print it. A and C. Isn't yeah, this, I, Adrian, uh, I'll get back to you, okay. but I, I, isn't, this, uh, isn't this sort of that situation? I mean, maybe. I, I guess I, two things about well, What do you think about how that was handled, I guess? Is I mean, well, three things then. First, I would have to actually go back and look at coverage. I think we, as a society, have this really terrible habit of saying, like, this thing never got any coverage. Like, you Google it, it actually, in fact, got a lot of coverage. So I'd have to actually challenge the premise that it wasn't covered. Uh, it's true that you didn't see, like, explosive New York Times investigations the week after. But again, it wasn't the most important story in the world based on the information that was there at the time to your AC point. And then the second thing I would say is I think it's actually a really good thing that journalists paused and asked questions when some of the most unreliable people in the political world came to them and said, to your point, we have the smoking gun. Like you, you should, your disposition as a journalist should be skepticism. I would hope they would do that regardless of what political party, but you know, Rudy Giuliani tells you something's true, like you should, Check. <laughs> um, so that's that. And then I, I, his, yeah, I, his hair is not really brown. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't speak to that. But, um, but yeah, so I, I don't know. I think uh, like the skepticism is a good thing. And then the thing I would say now is uh, it's, I do think it looks really bad today. I do think there is this narrative that is not just 
the right wing going after the New York Times or whatever. I think that, you know there's this question of of priorities and um, biases perhaps, but the sort of boring other explanation here has to do with the consolidation of media and the fact that if the big, most well-resourced news organizations in the world, the Times chief among them, don't pay attention to something, there's this whole you know, collection of news organizations around the world who don't frankly have the resources to go through every last email in Hunter Biden's laptop and verify for themselves. And so they're looking to who they see as reputable news outlets for some guidance. And so there, I mean, and there are reasons to criticize that, whether it's PAC mentality or whatever else, but I think there are boring journalism industry bureaucratic reasons too for why it unfolded the way it did. But Jonah, what Adrian just said, wouldn't, wouldn't a conservative listen to that and say that's exactly the problem? The Washington Post and the New York Times decided it wasn't a story because they have a liberal bias. I, I don't think you have to be a conservative to say that that's a problem. I think any journalist would say that's a problem. Yeah, I mean, I, for sure, a conservative, and I would argue that that I think it is, and we're not gonna do a whole media bias panel here in, in 12 minutes, but uh, confirmation bias is a bigger problem than liberal media bias, but the fact that uh, the media, the mainstream media is overwhelmingly left of center and is cued to all sorts of things that they want to be true um, and their skepticism is more likely to be aroused about things they don't want to be true, I think it's just a sociological fact. And it's certainly a fact that I think, uh, it's certainly something that conservatives believe. The reason I brought up the Hunter Biden bit of this is that, and this is why it gets so frustrating to talk to people about, is that it was labeled disinformation. We didn't know if it was disinformation or not. It certainly could have been. The story about how the Post got it was super sketchy. People forget, like, like, Fox News didn't run with it at first, right? So, I mean, there's all sorts of problems with it. Um, and I still think the story about how Giuliani got it is super sketchy. And, and so, like, a lot of places were like, we can't just spill this out, we gotta verify it. The Post went a different way, right? And I think the problem is, is that, I think the Post's decision to do that is totally open to criticism. Twitter and Facebook's decision to sort of render it invisible whether you think that was smart in the, mo in the heat of the moment or not, has backfired enormously. Because now it seems like it was all conspiratorial, it feeds into this paranoia about big tech, particularly on the right, and, and now that it turns out that the laptop was quote unquote true, in terms of the, it was authentic, um, as the Washington Post has confirmed, there are a whole bunch of people who think that, you talk about A to C, they now think that if only the media had told us about the laptop at the time, as the kid yesterday was suggesting, which I don't buy his you know, theory, that Trump would have won. You know, but for the censoring of the New York Post, Trump would have won. And it's, I think it's a preposterous counterfactual, but it's also an, it's impossible for me to refute. In the same way, I cannot refute that this bottle is keeping all the polar bears away. Right? Um, I mean, do you see any polar bears? Right? I cannot. I, I cannot prove the negative. And um, and this is just a. It, it it has now become. Can we lock the doors just? In case? <laughs> <laughs> it is. It has been wrapped into a much larger narrative. And um, and so when they hear disinformation, they say, Oh, you mean like Hunter Laptop, which actually turned out to be true? But this goes to definitions. I mean, so the the Harvard conference that Ben wrote about that you referenced, I actually attended, and Joan Donovan led, and she's here, so maybe yeah, you can so tell we'll us all about this later. Shortly. Um, but the the term she would use. Where are you? <laughs> the term you'll get rebuttal time. The term she would use is not disinformation, but media manipulation in mm -hmm. this case. And okay. so it wasn't that it was a laptop that didn't exist, or that it wasn't Hunter Biden's laptop. It was that it was positioned in front of journalists and the wider world in a way that was meant to manipulate people. Let me ask you a, another question, because Ben in his column uh, referenced a, a, a lengthy piece that was written in Harper's by I think one of your old colleagues, right? Yeah. Uh, Joe Bernstein mm -hmm. at the uh, uh, who, uh, tech reporter for BuzzFeed. Um, and, he and it was essentially an assault on what he calls big disinformation. And the theory was, and it's a little bit of what Ben's saying here, I think it was, it was, more, uh, uh, it was uh, more vigorously argued uh, with less nuance that uh, we overemphasize the power of the social web, of social media, uh, and we actually have strengthened it <laughs> because if people come to believe that it's that powerful, then it actually helps their advertising uh, uh, model 
Um, I know you read that piece. Um, what was your impression of it? No, you. Oh, me. Yes. Um, I thought it was really <laughs> compelling. Uh, I mean, I think it was a it was a well argued piece. I think there's some truth to it. Certainly, I think the idea that the platforms are being empowered by all this, like you know, arguably fear mongering, is not totally without merit. I also think that you look at these companies and they're among the most powerful and profitable in the world and you can't argue that they weren't powerful already anyway. They've dramatically changed the way that we all consume information and news. They've completely upended the journalism industry, which of course I care about. And so to, to suggest they're not powerful is ridiculous and wrong, but I think that there's certainly this emerging sort of buzzy big diso info economy or whatever you want to call it, and we should be skeptical, skeptical about that too. Um, because anytime you have something where, you know, uh, people are all sort of coalescing around a, a threat and, and position to make money off of it or to become famous off of it, like the, that, there's reason to ask questions there as well. Yeah, yeah, and I guess I think because I was writing that column for journalists because I was a media columnist and now starting a new news thing and thinking about this a lot. I do think that there's this like allure to journalists of like, cool, the misinformation beat. Like that's, kind of sexier and also, by the way, much easier than like going to Delaware and trying to figure out like what the hell is the story <laughs> with that laptop? Like that is kind of hard and kind of weird and kind of boring work. Like wh how did that guy get the laptop? Did Hunter give it to him? And these all details. And it's either true or it's false. And you kind of don't need to move up to the academic level of is it misinformation, disinformation, or media manipulation. Like I just think journalists are seduced often by these big narratives which have, you know, these, these big takes when I, I think often the real value that they can add is in determining these factual matters that really aren't that theoretical, aren't that hard to figure out, it's just work to figure them out. And that I think a lot of both the social platforms and a lot of the media kind of like likes, there are these stories, and this is another trend that's related, like if the right wing gets very excited about a story, a lot of the sort of large mainstream outlets with real reporting resources will just be like this whole landscape is polluted and toxic and we won't go into it and try to figure out what's true and just leaves these vacuums. And I think it's just, it was just easier in some ways for journalists to say, ah, this is misinformation, we'll stay away from it, than to like try to interview this weird repairman in Delaware and figure out what had actually happened. We're gonna take questions in one second here, so uh, those who wanna ask them, be, uh, be alert. Um, but Jonah, I, I, I'd, be, uh, I'd, I'd be remiss if before we left, I didn't ask you about your departure uh, from Fox News, and particularly about uh, the, the, the thing that occasioned your decision to leave, which was this streaming uh, a piece that, uh, I guess it was a, called a documentary or something, mm -hmm. that, that Tucker Carlson did called Patriot's Purge, that argued that the uh, the, the January 6th uh, insurrection was a false flag operation. Um, do you consider that a, a, an example of disinformation? And why was it only streamed? Why wasn't it on Fox News? Sure. I mean, uh, uh, first of all, I think Tucker's response to that question was, he was just asking questions, <laughs> right? Uh, and, um, you know, Steve, who was on a later panel, my co the co-founder, Steve Hayes, yes. Steve Hayes, who's the co-founder of the Dispatch, a very close friend of mine, um, who Jeffrey Goldberg confused for me uh, yesterday. Um, it happens all the time. Um, uh, He's just a self-hating Goldberg. Yeah, well, it happens. Hey, I, <laughs> Jeffrey and I get each other's anti-Semitic email all the time. Um, so, uh, you know, begins with J, Goldberg, <laughs> all the same. Anyway, so, uh, very brief. Um, uh, Steve will give a slightly different answer than I would, but for me, it was the Patriot Purge thing was a last straw rather than a um, mm -hmm. this is it kind of thing. Um, uh, because part of the problem was the direction of Fox, particularly Fox opinion. I will still defend a lot of the news part of Fox News, um, uh, but Fox opinion was going off into dangerous, fever swamp, irresponsible stuff. And, uh, and then Patriot Purge came out and was it disinformation? Um, I think it certainly can fall within the four corners of, it was, it was clever disinformation in the sense, when I say just asking questions, I wasn't. I wasn't asking you to rate it. I no, 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 I, I'm saying that uh, <laughs> four <Three> stars. stars. <laughs> um, it was, you know, I, I think it was probably pretty well lawyered to, uh, uh, 
avoid some of the problems of straight disinformation would get you. So, but it, when I say it was just asking questions, that is the classic tactic of disinformation artists. And I think in that sense, as a tactic, yes. Um, I, I think that uh, it, was full, it was full of insinuations of profound, and I would argue insidious lies. Um, that sounds like a pretty good yeah, definition. Yeah, and um, it was, so it was a sophisticated form of disinformation. Okay, um, Ben, why do you think they streamed it uh, and didn't air it? I mean, I think like there's a I think I mean having covered Fox for the last couple of years, very strange institution. No one is really in charge. Um, and we're gonna have a discussion later, generally, yeah. of the role of television. Um, it's you know it's been reported that Rupert Murdoch is unhappy with how far around the bend Tucker Carlson is, but also th there's a sort of style of management through plausible deniability that is just sort of how they operate and for a long time have. Like for since Roger Ailes died, just no one is in charge and Murdoch goes around deploring things that happen on this channel and kind of pretending he doesn't have control. And I think, you know, Tucker's, Tucker pushes stuff as far as he can get it. And this was as far as he but, can but get it. But I guess my but he, question but on, is, but actually his the two, streaming. But, but on air, Adrian, he did a lot of the same stuff. Adrian, I actually well, don't think it's an important distinction. He's saying the same stuff on air. I mean, I don't, I don't know enough about the streaming service to know, but if it's something that you have to pay for to get, they yes. probably put it there because they thought people would pay for it. Mm -hmm. I think it's a mixture of those things. I think the, the, the lack of editor, I was talking about editors before. Um, Tucker gets to do whatever he wants on the streaming platform, and so, uh, it was basically invisible to management. But probably got, well, it obviously got a lot of play broadly, but probably a lot of viral uh, sure. play as well. Wait, wait, you I say. Don't, I don't know if it did, okay. but it, it's a great question. I, right. I actually Someone subscribe. Someone look into that. I personally subscribe to the streaming service to watch it, so that's. <laughs> <laughs> it works. All right, let's take some questions. Uh, you have so, a question? David, I'm gonna actually just ask one on behalf of uh, Davey, who's watching online. Oh. Um, once doubt is so effectively sowed in the minds of so many people and trust is so deeply damaged across the board, how do we come back from that? How do we rebuild when no one trusts anyone or anything? Well, I trust any of you to answer that question, so who wants to take a... Um, I mean, I think that's like an incredibly hard question in the, in, the, in the notion that there's a single solution. You want me to move down? There's there? no easy answer, but <laughs> I do think, and this is something that I think news organizations have to reckon with is, that there's a shift in how people relate to the media. It's true in entertainment, it's true in sports, and it's true in news that they trust individuals more than they trust institutions. And people you know, know that there are things in the big, in like people approach the New York Times, the Washington Post, say, I know there's stuff in here I should trust, I know w there's some I shouldn't. It's, it's people are more, I guess, in some sense, sophisticated or paranoid consumers. And so I think the bet, certainly, that we're gonna be making is that people you know, need to have a little more transparency into who is delivering their news in a very straightforward way and under, I mean, and have relationships with the journalists, which, you know, proposes a whole other range of complicated problems. Adrian, isn't the curation, there's such a flood of material out there, isn't how, the, how your news is curated a big part of this? Absolutely, I mean, this may sound overly optimistic, but I really believe it, that it's in large part about creating places for people to disagree with one another. And certainly, we try to do that at the Atlantic all the time. But it's, you know, it, it, Maria talked about people not having snap reactions, uh, you know, and mobbing each other on Twitter. Obviously, that would be better if people could figure out how to restrain themselves. But in the meantime, journalists and journalistic enterprises can certainly make room for multiple viewpoints and show that disagreement is healthy. Um, I know I'm supposed to be the house goy as a conservative here, so I'll be very quick <laughs> and just say one of the answers is to stop thinking it's something that the media can fix itself. I think if the po one of the reasons why people invest so much in politics is because uh, we, g we cede more and more power to government in our lives, and so therefore we feel that, that the wrong people are going to govern how I live and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And if we could send more power down to the most local level possible, it would make more people happy. Well, and, and people themselves acting with more awareness and restraint and reflection uh, is, imp is important. Uh, I I'm gonna leave the last question for you, but we gotta take a couple of more. We, got, we don't wanna take advantage of your high office here. Yeah. Hi, my name is Graham Harway. I'm an MPP student here. <clears throat> so you talked about the, a lot about the definition of misinformation and disinformation, but it seems like with Hunter Biden's laptop, the Judge Jackson hearings, and even what the President said yesterday about 
um, you can keep your doctor. It's kind of the intentional misuse of information seems to be the largest and most insidious problem or the bad faith use. I guess my question is mostly for you, Jonah. Um, why does it seem like one side of the political spectrum wants to intentionally misuse facts more than the other as opposed to using false ones? Um, I, look, I, I agree with you. There's, there's an asymmetry between the right and the left on a lot of this stuff. But, uh, and I have, as a conservative, one of the reasons why I've taken the stances that I've taken in recent years is because I, I'm more bothered by people lying on my side than on the other side because, in effect, they're speaking for me. And one of the reasons why Steve and I founded the dispatch is to disassociate ourselves with some of that stuff. Um, and so I, if, if, you're, if you come from a left of center perspective, I can understand why you think it's you know, so much more worse on one side than the other side. I will just tell you, it is a problem with American culture generally. American culture has a problem with cancel culture. American culture has a problem with manipulating narratives rather than just recounting facts. Do they, they may manifest themselves differently on different sides of the aisle, but the paranoid style in American politics, contrary to what Richard Hofstetter described it as, is not fundamentally or solely a right-wing thing. It's an American thing. And these, are, these problems are upstream of their partisan manifestations. And so I think Donald Trump gave a lot of bad people permission, uh, the permission structure to do a lot of bad things. And I've been banging my spoon on my high chair about it for about six years now. Um, but I do not let the left off the hook for a lot of the wrong and bad and manipulative things that come from the left. Um, I just don't think fighting fire with fire is a wise or honorable form of politics. Jeff Goldberg, did you, where, does someone have a microphone? You want to just, can you get a mic, Tim? We're, we've run over, but I'm putting this on your account. Uh, <laughs> it's fine. I'll, I'll be quick. Um, Although I, I, I do want to note that um, I was giving a speech once and someone got up and accused me of um, doing terrible things with my National Review column. <laughs> uh, and I could not convince them that there are more than, there's more than one Goldberg. <laughs> no, I just couldn't give it, that was disinformation. No, it's a question for, it's a question for Jonah, but I guess all, all, all four of you. Um, I, I am curious to, to understand um, what specifically you think, and, and by the way, it was it was a very brave thing that you and Steve Hayes, who are in fact the same person, um, what you and Steve Hayes uh, did by leaving Fox, but um, I want to hear more about what you think the mainstream media can do. I understand your point about upstream and downstream, but um, we worry, and we should worry, um, that the same issues that um, the same problems that have infected Fox News. We can spend a lot, you can spend whole conferences talking about Fox News, but I really want to hear you get granular on what the quote unquote mainstream media is doing wrong um, in relationship to disinformation and misinformation and, and how we have to, uh, and things that you believe we have to change and obviously Ben and Adrian should just. Well, I, 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 again, it's a long answer, but, uh, and I don't want to. Give, give a long answer in a short way. Yeah. So. First of all, to take the second half first, uh, the biggest problem, again, is confirmation bias more than, and groupthink more than strictly ideological bias. Um, have more conservatives in your editorial rooms, right? I mean, like, Dan Rather would not have climbed up the jackass tree and fell down hitting every branch on the way over the memo gate story if they just had one person in the room who didn't want that story to be true, right? It was too good to check. And so everyone was all in on saying, we're, we've got the story, we're gonna nail George W. Bush. And if you had just one person in the room says, you know, I really don't want this to be true, and they asked painful questions, 60 Minutes wouldn't have done that. Dan Rather wouldn't have done that. I think, same thing on, on the Brett Kavanaugh stuff. When you watch from the conservative point of view, the hysterical derogation of journalistic standards that you saw at a lot of mainstream places to give credit to unverified, illegitimate, untrue accusations, or at the very least, unverifiable accusations, right? I'm sorry? Yeah, I think what The, I think what, uh, the New Yorker did was outrageous, where um, they just simply trafficked in this sort of innuendo stuff about Brett Kavanaugh. Um, you had all sorts of people starting from the position that his accusers were telling the truth, even though they could not verify any of it. If you want to talk about something that united the right to this day, um, that the Kavanaugh confirmation hearings are basically 
um, you know, the, the Sacco and Vanzetti of the cultural right these days. And um, if you just simply had people who were skeptical in the room who didn't want that story to be true, and said, you know, can we, we you got A, but where the hell is B? Um, it would have helped a lot. And I think that the, so much of the confirmation bias and groupthink problems among mainstream media organizations is their concept of diversity is so mired in this sort of two-dimensional understanding of sort of woke identity politics rather than other useful terms like ideological diversity or, 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 or even partisan diversity. Um, and I think that's the biggest driver of the problems you get in the mainstream media. Okay, I feel like that was cathartic for you. A little bit. Yes, uh, yes. I, I, I wouldn't want to hear the long answer. Yeah. Okay, Adrian. I, I mean, I think you said it well. I think the, the thing I would add is not just for the media, but for everyone, just building off of what Jenna was saying, which is just a disposition of asking, how do you know? So whatever information you're encountering on whatever social platform, in whatever newspaper, whatever, wherever you're reading it, the question is, to, to ask yourself is, how do you know, or how did they know, or how, where is this coming from? And I think... Basic it's, reporting. Well, not just reporting, but it, like a disposition of skepticism. For reporters, certainly, report, and that's what we're paid to do. Um, but for people who are trying to sift through this informational environment, oh, I, I think just like carrying on that sort of journalistic question asking mindset. Yeah, I mean the question was though what uh, <coughs> news organizations should do, so you're the big media critic. Yeah, um, well now I'm putting myself in a position to be criticized. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean I think actually what Adrian said about disagreement is really important and I think that the forms of journalism don't really often, if you read a newspaper article, they don't really say, look I'm a reporter, here is what I have reported. Also like part of this article is my analytical take and you're free to disagree with that, but you have to agree with me on the facts. And I think the forms of, of kind of newspaper journalism have always kind of blended those things and it's valuable to separate them. I also do think that just for, for journalists, for consumers, we're all subject to the same kinds of, you know, illusions on social media. And, and it's just like that feeling of this story just has to, it's so right, it has to be true. Like that story is always false. And just sort of knowing that, that the stories you like best, the ones that are surfaced to you most on social media, are like almost always false, is a good discipline. Yeah. I, I, we're, we've strayed from the topic and way over time. I would just say, when I was a young reporter, uh, someone who I was an official in the county penal system here or whatever, <laughs> um, reported to me that a guy had gone on a bus who had gone on a bus and killed people was the brother of a, another guy who had gone on the bu uh, bus, and, which was a pretty good story. Good story. Um, but I couldn't, I, I had questions about it. Um, the desk was hot for it. I told them, hold the story until I could, but I, I, I wrote what I knew, but hold it until I could confirm it. It accidentally ran, and the next day I got a letter from a lawyer who said, I represent so-and-so who is not related to so-and-so. Uh, it was a sobering yeah. uh, lesson. Anyway, thanks for indulging us. Um, we're, we're, we're now gonna move on to people who uh, uh, are expert in, <laughs> in, and actually expert in disinformation and uh, think it's a pretty big problem. Uh, uh, and I'm, I think we're gonna have a great day, but you guys, you guys are great, and uh, it's important to remember there are nuances here. If we're going to restore trust, we've got to recognize that, and I guess that's the point of this panel. So thank you. Thank you.